welcome to Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. This episode, we're joined for the first time by a live studio audience. <laughs> now let's meet the actors. We have Army Hammer, Diane Kruger, Brian Cranston, Margot Robbie, Robert Pattinson, and Octavia Spencer. Let's get started. <laughs> okay, now the question. This is the first time we have mixed male and female actors on the same round table. So what is an issue that you have always wanted to discuss with actors of the opposite sex? Brian. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever, um, you've, we've had crushes on people that we've worked with. Have you ever followed through? Is this, can we do like 20 <laughs> questions? Is yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> um, have you ever worked with someone you despised? If so, how did you work through it? Hmm, that's a good question. I have. Mm. I have too, I think. Yeah? Uh, how did you deal with it? But I was only on the set for one day. So. <laughs> <laughs> was By it choice? You got fired? <laughs> it's like, no, I was, I can't say that I despised him, but you know, when a person looks past you and like really doesn't address you and mm. the director's talking and they close the door in your mm. face, it's like, mm. I hate you with all of my heart. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I just think that person's a miserable person. So I really didn't have to do anything because I was only there for a day. But years later, I met that person again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you tell him? No. I no? just I you just, just smiled? Oh, they literally walked up to me as if they had been kind. And I'm oh. like, I've had a, a, um, an actor um, send a stand in to do my off-camera once. Mm. <gasps> Yeah. Yeah. That, had that happened to you? A, it did actually early on. Yeah, me too. Yeah, early on. with the female star yeah. of the show, and uh, I didn't, I didn't do it. I said no. She needs to be here. Mm -hmm. It was a very emotional scene. Exactly. I can understand if it was something simple and you're just walking past or something, but no. I, I think you have to establish a sense of. Of respect, and camaraderie, like you, yeah. you know, yeah, and do that. I mean, well, that's, that's just plain rude. I think. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I feel like you need to change your profession if you don't want to show up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. Like, mm -hmm. Margot, how do you handle conflict when it arises? I avoid conflict at all costs, and I haven't worked with an actor that I've despised, but I, I have worked with someone on the production side who I didn't appreciate the way they spoke about me in front of groups. So. Took me a couple months, but then eventually I plucked up the courage and pulled them aside and said, you know, you're discrediting what I do when you speak to me like that. And uh, he was really great about it. And you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to get to a place where you feel comfortable doing that? I mean, you, Rob, you started as a young actor. Uh, did you have to get up courage to assert yourself on set with people? I can't. I just run away and cry. Really? <laughs> still? Like, still. No, I don't really. Well, I don't know. I do. No, I mean, I just try and avoid it, and hopefully they'll just see what they're doing that's wrong. Never, ever, ever works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it just gets worse and worse. But at the same time, I feel like it completely throws me off if I'm trying to, if I have to say, like, hey, this is my process. It's like, I don't know what my process is. It just needs to be some kind of understanding that you're trying to do something good. You're not just, like, messing around. I don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. And what helps for us is that we know that there's a finite amount of time that we're going to spend with that person or persons. And so we can just endure and tolerate until you kind of navigate your way through it mm -hmm. and the, the movie's over or whatever. And you well, unless on. you're on a television show for seven seasons. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really important. Here's, you know, it's not imperative that you get along with your co-stars. It's like your in-laws. It just makes things easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just makes things nicer to be with, you know? And so, yeah, you make an effort to, to get to know them and to know how they work because every actor works differently and it works well for them. And every other actor has to respect and understand how that happens. Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest and set a, 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 an example of of how you work and how you're going to go about it. Diane and I worked together and we shared a lot of that. You know, how do you want to approach this scene and that, so. I find that, that the longer I do this, the more I find that that's just as pivotal a part of doing your job as having your lines down, knowing your character, knowing yourself, all that, because 
you can have your own process, but if you can't fit your process mm -hmm. into the organic process that is the whole project you're working on, right. then yeah. it doesn't really do you any good. You have to figure out how to do what you want to do while also not fucking up somebody mm -hmm. else's process. Yes. Right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's all kind of, yeah. it's a very sort of cohesive, delicate, symbiotic yeah. thing. I delicate. agree. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of scenes make you nervous? All of them, all in of one them. way or another. <laughs> yeah. uh, honestly, the, the scenes that make me the most nervous are the ones where you have the least amount to do, where you're just there, and everyone else is doing a bunch of stuff, and you have one thing to do, like mm -hmm. one line, one thing to say. For some reason, it's, it's harder to get kind of into that rhythm and all that, and then you just mm -hmm. end up like waiting to do your thing, and it's, it's kind of distracting as opposed to just kind of <laughs> going along with it and being a part of it. In Call Me By Your Name, there's a lot of you know, intimate scenes, and you really had to go there. Did those kinds of scenes make you nervous, or was that just par for the course? They might have on another project, but on that one, everything just felt so safe. We felt like we were in such capable hands, and we felt like we had such freedom to explore and to be ourselves and to mess up, and it was all okay. No matter what happened, it felt like we were really protected by Luca and by, by everybody, so we didn't really have that. Hmm. I like the way you say things. I don't know why you're always putting yourself down, though. So you won't, I guess? You really that afraid of what I think? <sighs> Making things very difficult for me. I remember I remember specifically, you know, we had some, you know, uh, scenes that were sort of sans clothing, and by the end of the first day, they call cut, and then someone comes up and goes, do you want a robe? And you just go, no, it's fine, we're gonna shoot it again in a second. I'll just, you, know, you just feel safe, you know? Yeah. Uh, for the others, what kinds of scenes make you nervous, or especially nervous? Oh, well, I'm dyslexic, so anything where I have to do something. <laughs> if I'm just talking, or you know, just walking, but if you have me doing a lot of stuff, it's like I actually have to learn my lines by doing the action so yeah. that when I actually have to do it, I can throw it away. Otherwise, it's like, I'm folding. Oh, wait, I'm folding. But right. in real life, you don't think about folding. Mm -hmm. You just fold. Right. So I have to learn things do, by doing things if I have to do things. Does that sound crazy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no crazy. No crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Totally crazy. <laughs> How about you, Margo? I, I get nervous in any time I have to act on my own. I, I that that feels really weird to me for some reason. I, you mean I, solo in a scene? Solo in a scene, mm -hmm. which I mean that actually happens kind of rarely. But uh, I, I need to be with other actors. Then all my focus is, mm. on, is on what they're doing, and mm. then all I need to do is react to it. And um, I'm just too in my head if I'm if mm. I'm on my own. That's funny. Your role in The Big Short was all solo scenes. Yeah, but really, because I was looking at the camera, it kind of felt like I was having a chat to everyone. I, yeah. I don't know. It, it, while in a bathtub. While in a bathtub, yeah. you know, <laughs> drinking my champagne. It's the easiest day of work I've ever done in my life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Half a day shooting in a mansion in Malibu with real 20-year-old Dom Perignon that Adam McKay pulled out. It was, really? yeah, it was, oh. it was like, I was like, this never dream. happened. Now, were your lines on a teleprompter? <laughs> no, no, I knew oh, it. that would have been the easiest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> Those lines were difficult, too. Yeah, I mean, I had to, like, I just had to research it and kind of actually understand it, because I was, I couldn't get all the technical lingo down without actually knowing what I was saying. So mm. once uh, I figured that out, it was How fine. do you prepare for a role generally? Like, for I, Tanya, obviously, you had to learn to ice skate, and yeah. you know, was that part of the appeal of the role? Was that you would have to dive in and learn this, or was it sort of the thing you had to do in order to play the part? Yeah, no, I get excited with every character when there's a skill set you get to learn for it. And mm -hmm. we get like, we're so lucky and spoiled in that they get someone really good to teach you how to do it too. So it's nice. Like when I did Focus, I had a real life pickpocket teach me how to pickpocket. Like I was like, this is exciting. Um, have you I can use it. Okay, wait a second. I have all your phones and watches. <laughs> yes, uh, I say. Check your pockets. No, um, so that was exciting. But the, the I mean, that's, that's mechanical preparation. That just, you know, you put the hours in and it pays off. But uh, beyond that, I, I am kind of like a crazy person when I prep, I do. I do timelines and backstories, and I work with a dialect coach and a movement coach and an acting coach. Mm. And 
I just, yeah, I need to do a lot before I show up to set so I can throw it all out the window when I get on set. But, yeah. but if I hadn't done all the work beforehand, I, I would just be too scared to. Did you watch a lot of footage of Tanya Harding? And, and I've to... watched every single piece of footage <laughs> there is on her um, wow. a thousand times over. And I would I had a voice in my iPod. I'd go to sleep listening to her. I mean, it, I like <laughs> lived in Tanya land for, for a, a long time. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? This is how it's done. Some of these girls have paid their dues. I don't give a shit. I outskated them today. We also judge on presentation. Well, you know what? If you can come up with $5,000 for a costume for me, then I won't have to make one. Till then, just stay out of my face. Maybe you're just not as good as you think. Maybe you should pick another sport. Suck my dick. Were you able to talk to her uh, in preparing for it? I, I purposely didn't um, because there was so much online that I could do. I could study her. You know, at 15, there's a documentary made about her. She's interviewed all throughout her <coughs> 20s, pre and post incident. Mm. And then obviously documentaries made about her in her 40s as well. And so I was playing her 15 to 44. Right. And I had all that information there at my fingertips. So I, I uh, intentionally prepped for the character without having met her mm. so that I could keep her and the character separate. And then once I decided exactly how I was going to play the character, how I was going to play every single beat, then I went to meet her. I, I didn't want to meet her and be altering, like, or second guessing what I decided right. to do. So right. I waited, and then I met her a week before we started shooting. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, she was really understanding about it. Honestly, I was like, I'm playing a character. It's, it's, you know, in my mind, there's a difference, and and yeah. she was, all things considered, really, really understanding about it. Is there a role where the preparation and what you would have to do to prepare was part of the reason you took the role? If the movie took place on like a like an island somewhere, that right. may factor into my, <laughs> yeah, into your consideration. Shoot in Hawaii for a month, that'd be nice. That's kind of what Margot said. You get to do something different yeah, for every right, yeah, thing. Right. So yeah. if if you haven't gotten to do it yet, you might get to. So right. it's all just kind of part and parcel. Yeah. But you've never taken a role where it's you know I'll, oh I'll get to learn how to you know. Rock climb or something. Some I did a hiking stuff. movie and we never hiked. Really? No way. <laughs> no. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to lose so much weight. <laughs> and we just literally walked across a trail and then we picked up, you know, walking out. Yeah. Of, so there was no hiking. So mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I've turned down a movie because it required me riding a horse and I'm super scared of horses. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I was like, I can't do it. I can't. I don't want to do it. I hear you, I've been honey. thrown off so many times. I, I, I cannot. Oh my I, God. I, I like, I don't. Do you like horse meat? <laughs> no, yeah. No. I've turned down roles because, uh, the, the, well, no, amongst other things, but it did factor into my decision is the idea of wearing a corset for like six months. I was like, I can't, I just, wow. I can't do that. Or, or a full on prosthetic. Oh, you know, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely, yeah. I just. Yeah. You've done that, haven't you? I've, yes, I've done uh, that. It's It can be very claustrophobic, actually. Yes. Um, very claustrophobic. When you're only, the only connection to life is through the nostrils. <laughs> That's the only thing, everything else is covered. Everything. It's a little daunting mm -hmm. to do And then to act in that for 14 hours, oh. it's just... Yeah. So that's a that's a bit much, but I did I took on uh, Lyndon Johnson because of the fact that I could research uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the first president that I ever really paid any attention to. Well, I was about seven years old when Kennedy was killed, and then I I knew something was gravely wrong. My parents and every every neighbor was weeping during this, mm. and I thought I, I need to pay attention. There's something going on that's more important than me. And at seven, mm -hmm. I got I it was my first breaking out of my own self-centered nature, you know. Mm. And this new president was Lyndon Johnson, and then years later I had this opportunity to play him. So, I mean, for actors, it's it, I love the research part of it. Yeah, yeah. We, it, to be able to dive in and go through a treasure chest of mm -hmm. who knows what. Uh, and then you couple that with your imagination and the text and, and your talent, and you put it all together and hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there a role or a, even a portion of a role, a line, that has particularly <laughs> stuck with you years later from someone you've played? Mm. People walk up to me all the time and just say three little words at the strangest time. I don't want to say it because, mm -hmm. you know, it's 
eat my shit. I mean, oh, my right, character right. said it. <laughs> and I, and, and Are you I, sure the reference in the movie? I, I'm not it's kidding. It's a good thing you restrained yourself and didn't I'm, say it. I just, yeah. <laughs> because you guys are like, what can it be? Yeah. And, I, it's, it's, and it's really strange because if when you're in your life and you're at the grocery store and you're in your own, you're like trying to figure out how do I tell if this is a ripe... Or, 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 how do I choose? And somebody just leans in and says, "Eat my." And all of a sudden, like, what's going on? And oh, okay. So it, it's it, it's 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 interesting. Huh. That is interesting. Uh, how about you? Up? The unfortunate catch trade. Doesn't have to be something people say to you. It could just be something. No that one's stuck ever with said you. this to me. <laughs> but I think I I think my prostate is asymmetrical. I always really love that. I what is that from? That. From Cosmopolis. Ah. And I always, and, and it's me, and, me and Paul Giamatti uh, have this thing where I say, I say it to him when we're crying together. And he's like, mine too. And I'm like, what does it mean? And he's like, it's nothing. It's a harmless variation. At your age, why worry about it? And that's it's one of my favorite scenes I've ever done. But there's something, I just, <laughs> there's something really profound for me anyway. Couldn't tell you what it means. Okay. <laughs> How about the others? Things that have stuck with you. Michael Stuhlbarg has a speech in Call Me By Your Name, uh, and it's, I don't get to say it, and it's one of the most beautiful monologues mm. I've ever seen in my life. It and it truly changed the way that I'm gonna parent my children, the way I look at people, the way, I mean, everything. It was just like a, one of those. One at the end? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, just one of those things that from that moment, you know that that changed the rest of my life. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about this medium specifically is it's very subjective. It can be, you know, eat my shit. It can be whatever. <laughs> so it's just like one of those things that kind of changes your perspective for the rest of your life. So, you guys have one? I have a lot from Breaking yeah. Bad. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of iconic lines. Right. That. What of the Breaking Bad lines do people most approach you with? So, well, um, I am the danger, or mm -hmm. I'm the one who knocks. Mm. Tread oh, yeah. lightly. Uh, there's all all kinds. Of, those are good, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those are good lines. Very fortunate. We had good writers. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's the key, man. <laughs> okay, is there an actor that you think had closest to the perfect career? Someone uh, that you look yeah. at and say, "I want this person's career." They had it. They had everything right. Meryl Streep. <laughs> no faux pas over, there. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Kate Blanchett. Really admire the choices she's made. And she's Australian. And she's Australian, which makes it seem like it's a more attainable dream somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg for me. Oh, interesting. Mm. And Morgan Freeman. Huh. So a combination of both. Okay. Yeah. Whoopi Whoop Freeman. Whoopi <laughs> Freeman. <laughs> I just love a lot of the choices that she made as an actress. And also Kathy Bates has made mm. some very interesting. I mean, we could talk for hours yeah, about yeah, those, yeah. yeah, for me. The common denominator so far is that all these women and men are doing comedies and dramas. They're kind of floating in between, and I think most of us would love to have that as our body of work, that you, you're not pigeonholed to any one thing, but you can move depending on how uh, any particular story resonates, but comedy, drama, stage, film. Mm -hmm. Which you did so well. I mean, going from Malcolm in the Middle, which is one of the funniest shows that's yes. been on television to then Breaking Bad, which is one of the best dramas that's been on television, you know? Yeah. I've been lucky. Yeah. Been lucky. But it's, you know, I don't want to repeat myself. A lot of the times the, the roles that I take are, are things that kind of scare me. If, if, it, if it makes me mm. a little tingly, yeah. then it's like, ooh, oh, 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 <laughs> yeah. I could fail at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, that's true. <laughs> Brian, what about Last Flag Flying scared you? The character I played in Last Flag was huge. He is a massive consumer. He takes the air out of the room. He says yes to everything. Drugs, drink, women, you know. But he also says yes to being a friend. He's the first one to say, what do you need? And I told Richard Linklater, I said, I, I feel like the only way I can really understand this character is if I go way out there. So I'm, if, when I go out on that limb, if you start to hear it crack, <laughs> pull me back. How did it happen that this boy was shot in the back of the head like a dog? He was a brave Marine, credit to the Corps, and he served his country well. Yes, he did. So did we all, every one of us here. And we'd do it again if we had the chance. What's going on, Sal? I don't know, that's, that's why I'm asking. I know there were takes when I was just massive but I have to try that in order to know, to feel like oh, that was wrong, mm -hmm. and to, to try to find that sweet spot. It's ephemeral, it, it, it comes and goes. You, don't, you can't 
repeat it take after take. It, it depends on how you feel at any given time. But it was a beautiful film and lovely bonding with Steve Carell and Lawrence Fishburne and, and having Richard Linklater to be our conductor. Uh, it's very heartfelt and it was a great experience. Are any of you the kind of actors who will cold call other actors? Uh, when I saw Wonder Woman, I, um, as soon as I went home, I, I wrote to Patty and Gal. I'd never met either of them before, but I wrote to them and just said, you've made me feel so proud to be a woman in the DC universe. Wow. Thank you. That's Thank cool. you for opening this up for the rest of us, really. Mm -hmm. I emailed Sam Hayek after I saw Beatrice at dinner. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought it was such a beautiful film and like, mm -hmm. not a lot of people had seen it. Mm -hmm. And I saw it on a plane. And the movie is amazing. And <laughs> so she's good. so amazing, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. I sent an email to a guy I knew who just did a film this year. Um, beautiful film. And he took great risk and did a wonderful job in it in a film called uh, Call Me By Your Name. Mm -hmm. And uh, he never responded. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick. I wrote, yeah, I I wrote a, a, what I thought was a very lovely letter. And I said, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Said, it was too beautiful. I couldn't it's really reply. It's really wonderful. You know, it actually, Brian wrote me an email uh -huh. <laughs> after Cam, which is really sweet. How do you get each other's emails? Well, we I know, together. I'm like, I, I, need to, I need to dig into this email game. <laughs> I sell them, so anytime, <laughs> anybody you want, I can it. Uh, no, um, but it's like, you know, it, it, just to say one more thing about that, it, I, I think actors have a tendency to be reticent on coming forward and telling someone of a performance that affected them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I, I think it's great to do what you did, to do what you did, mm -hmm. to be able to say, I don't know them or what, I just want to reach out and yeah. say, your work affected me and bravo. Yeah. And, and thank you for that. For a couple of years, I was always too, I always wanted to, but I was too scared. I was like, mm. well, who am I to like, right. I, we who am I to reach out, out to them? Like, yeah. no, they don't want to hear from me. And then I, I voiced that to someone, they're like, would you like it if someone reached out and said they appreciated your work? And I was like, yeah, that would mean the world to me. Yeah. Yes, I should definitely email them. Right, right. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a mentor when you're on set? I don't, but others may. When, when you lead a cast, um, you have the opportunity to, to wear the mantle of, of a leader. Right. And I choose to do that. But I don't have to be if I'm not. The, uh, it depends on where the energy goes. Mm -hmm. um, I just did a movie with Kevin Hart. He takes over. And I was <laughs> happy to step back and go, you run it. Right. And he was a blast and a hard worker and a great. So I don't have to. But I think it's important um, to do it, if, if that is your responsibility. If you're number one on the call sheet, I make sure that when anybody comes on to a movie or a television show that I'm doing, or producing or whatever, and they have that one line, and they're nervous as hell, mm. is to reach out and, and to welcome them to that. Because, for two reasons, it's the right thing to do. It's a, to reach out and help them out. But when they calm down, if someone is calm, they do better. Yeah, mm. they, I love they Ted perform Danson. better. I, I love Ted Danson to this day because he made a point. I did his show Becker, and I have severe stage fright. And we did the run through, and he came up to me and he just said, "Oh my God, you are this, 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 and this." And it's like oh, Ted Danson said that to me, and I have loved him forever. And I think, and that's the motto that I uh, follow as well because it really does. It helps everyone mm. if everyone it feels on equal footing, yeah. you know? I, I appreciate yeah. that. Have either of you had mentors? Um, I've definitely felt like I have looked up to people and, and admired their work, um, you know, and they have shaped, I think, who I am as an actor today, including this sir sitting there, you know, because you look up to them. I, you, when you admire someone's work, you, but you want to follow their lead, you know? Like what Brian said, he was an amazing leader on the movie that we did, which was not an easy film to make. And uh, many challenges. And, Sorry, um, which film was it? The Infiltrator. Oh, okay, yeah. And without him and being so calm and being so kind to everyone, including myself, and just being the first one on set and, you know, doing amazing work, and, and he just really made every 
thing and everybody feel it was going to be okay, even though it was a, you know, chaotic at times. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's sometimes very hard, but, yeah. but we're very lucky. I, think yeah. the, I don't think you can say it's hard work without saying, but right. we're very lucky mm -hmm. to be able to say that we're actors and this is what we do for a living. We tell stories, please. Uh, there are people who work for a living and we get mm. to play. play. But yeah. that, so when I am on a set, I try to say that uh, artistic frustration is always expected and absolutely, we're all gonna have that and we might even have some skirmishes within our family. But I really don't wanna discuss anything. I don't wanna hear how the bitching and complaining about you know, how long the hours are. I just, we're so lucky to be able to do this. But you didn't achieve stardom, whatever that means, until somewhat later in your career. Do you think that gave you that kind of perspective? Yeah, I and did. Do, so do you, do you find yourself saying things to, to actors who maybe don't have that perspective? Well, I just try to do it by example. Mm -hmm. yeah. I learned it from Tom Hanks. Mm -hmm. I've known him for 30 years, and he's given me opportunities, and I've watched him on the set. I How see, did you meet? Uh, our wives are very good friends, and uh, my wife was in their wedding, and so that's 30, 30 years ago. And um, so I was able to watch firsthand how a, a, a young man who is a star comports himself and treats other people and is able to cr create an atmosphere on the set that is fun and engaging and welcoming of thoughts and ideas and get the work done and then see ya, go home. And I thought, oh, that's nice. That's, that's a good way to live. And you can have it all. You don't have to be the tortured actor and, and making everyone's life miserable. It doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> right, right. Is, is that your experience too? You also kind of achieved stardom a little bit later. Do you think that, that gave you perspective? It's weird because I don't see myself as a person who's a she starred him. I, I, I get to work and I love doing what I do. Um, but I can tell you that if the success that I have achieved up until this point, if I had uh, and achieved, I'm sorry, we can tell I have not slept in hours, right? <laughs> um, the, the, if I had, ha if all of this had happened for me at age 26, mm -hmm. I probably would not have been able to handle it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Working uh, with Sandra Bullock is, is um, watching her example and Matthew McConaughey and Sam Jackson on my very first movie and how they worked with the crew and took care of their crew and, and each other. I said, okay, I want to be that one day. If I'm ever that lucky, right. that's yeah. how I want to, to be. And I, I feel like I have, uh, unless, you know... It's, Early in the morning, I haven't had any coffee. Right. <laughs> well, you're sitting next to a guy who had, you know, superstardom at a very young age, and you've, it seems, deliberately taken roles that are in smaller, more filmmaker-driven films uh, since the Twilight franchise. Now, do you ever see yourself going back to more blockbuster, big-budget type films, or do you prefer this? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I always kind of fool myself sometimes into thinking that there's some kind of macro plan to like my decision making but it's not I mean it's just sort of you just try and find anything which you hopefully will connect to and you think you can somehow make it a little bit better or, or any or just do anything with it I don't know I mean I, I all like getting into Twilight and everything everything felt so accidental maybe it's just some kind of self-protection <laughs> like where I'm just like oh it's all just a, like you know everything's just kind of happened by accident um but I don't know. I mean, I, I think in the same way that I, when you get incredibly lucky with with having roles which give you, which afford you um, the opportunity to do smaller things. Um, what appealed great. to you about Good Time? Because it's, it's a dark role. I mean, there was no role when I first signed up to it. There's no script or anything. I just really liked the trailer to <laughs> the director's previous movie. And really, I, I'm starting to find as well that I'm just basically playing a director. Like every single time, in one way or another, I, I think that's the only way I can really figure it out. And I really liked their energy just as people. They're like little dynamos. And I'd kind of, I'd played a lot of parts which were quite reactive and quite passive. Mm. And uh, I just wanted to play a part which was really on the front foot and also didn't have any shame and any fear. 
Excuse me. Are you Peter? Yes, I am. We're in the middle of Nick. hello. Nick, we're what are you doing? We're in the middle of something here. We're in the middle on, of the exam. Up. Hey, That's hey, Nick, about Nick. The stuff and the, the pan and the wait, chicken. Wait, 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 please. Nick. How would you like it if I made you cry? How would you like that? No, I would not. But on, could, get up. But they, they told me I had to do this stuff. Let's go. Can let's go. No, but he wrote me. He has all my stuff. Rip down all my Nick. stuff. Shut up, so, then. Nick, this is my right work. Here. This is my stuff, okay? Nick. Oh, shame on you, kind shame brother. Shame on me? You're not helping. Shame on you. Shame on you. In the first draft of the script, there were certain scenes in it where I was reading, and I'm like, Jesus, I don't even know if this is legal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, is there a loophole? If you do something in a movie, does that make it legal? Right. <laughs> um, um, but, um, and, and it, it's exciting. I mean, there's so, there so many other things that get in the way of making a movie, like people who are providing the money say you can't do this, or, you know, and when you have someone who's really kind of punk and just says, I don't even care. I have this opportunity to make it, and this might be my last opportunity. I'm going to do whatever I want. And you so rarely meet those people. When I, when I work with Claire Denis afterwards, and, mm -hmm. uh, and she's like that as well, where it's just kind of, and she's been doing that for movie after movie her whole career. I think it's just like, you know, my own insecurities or whatever, I want to, I want to find someone who doesn't have them and just be like, okay, I'm, if I just hold onto the train, the train will go through the wall and everything will be fine. <laughs> so much of an actor's career is the choices that you make. I'm curious, Brian, is there something on your IMDb page that you would love to expunge? One thing. <laughs> Amazon women from the moon. Okay. Is that real? Is one of my favorites, so it's not that. <laughs> That's a real movie. Yeah, Joe Dante directed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> what, was your, what, was your, what was your role? <laughs> that was uh, that was early on. I think I was paramedic number two. <laughs> Back when you didn't have names, you know. Was, yes, um, I know that. <laughs> it was just a silly. I never saw it, so I don't even know right. what it's about, really. But and. It's about uh, Amazon women on the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Aside from the Amazon women on the moon, I know nothing about it. <laughs> Apparently, one of them needed a paramedic, I guess. <laughs> uh, how about the others? One credit you could disappear from IMDb. Just one, Army. Just one. <laughs> I, played, I played a character back when you don't get names. You get mm. either numbers or like a bad descriptor. I played Abercrombie Boy. <laughs> <laughs> In what? It was called Spring Breakdown. Okay. So yeah. You have to take your shirt off, I'll bet. Oh, I, had, I had a tequila shot taken off of my body, ah. which, was, which was apple juice, and then salt, which was like sugar. So by the end of the day, which was shot in like a foam party, I mean, it, just, it just got like worse and worse and worse. And worse. It was, you know, when I was younger, um, I did a deodorant commercial. That was a proud moment. <laughs> <laughs> Even as I was doing it, I was like... <laughs> I wish I wasn't doing it. I'm going to fire my agent. Yeah. <laughs> Even that spasm of embarrassment you find when you first watch it, you just wait like five, six years and everything, you're like, ah, oh, I actually really like that. <laughs> I've gotten away with it. Right, right. Um, Octavian, Shape of Water, you had to sign on to doing that film not knowing what this fish monster thing would look like, right? Mm -hmm. What is that conversation with Guillermo del Toro like? Well, I can tell you this. I, before even meeting Guillermo, I have seen or had seen every movie he'd ever directed and most of the things that he'd executive produced because I'm a fantasy horror fan. So when he called, I literally like leapt at the chance to, to work with him and we, met for 30, it was supposed to be for 30 minutes, but it turned into a three hour conversation. And he only mentioned the the role as he was paying. And he said, I wrote this part for you and, and I don't want to tell you anything about it. I just want you to read it. And I'm thinking, well, I'm in, but ooh, okay. Well, let me see what my character's going to be doing. Yeah, that's good. Keep that up. Looking like you don't know anything. Lord, help me if they ask me if I do. I'm not a good liar. Except Proust. It takes a lot of lies to keep a marriage going. All personnel, prepare to present your identity and clearance cards. Security what? measures have been increased. What in the... Levels. Attention. All personnel, prepare to present your identity and clearance cards. Security measures... You don't got us in a world of trouble. I didn't care what the creature was going to look like because I 
his signature is, there is always a creature. Mm. Right. So I, I knew the creature was gonna be great, and it was an easy decision for me to make. How did he shoot the, was it CGI, was it practical? Was that someone in a suit, or someone with the dots, or was it the suit it was painted? A suit. And... It was an actor in a suit, and let me tell you, it was so wonderful yeah. to have him there, mm -hmm. to have a real actor act opposite you. He was amazing. It's 90% actor, 10% mm -hmm. CGI. Mm -hmm. Doug did all of that work. Doug Jones? Doug Jones. Amazing, mm -hmm. yeah. He is amazing. Wow. It's interesting. So good. Margo, you, you come from Australia and you've done a lot of studio movies. I'm curious, what surprised you about working in Hollywood? What most surprised you? Well, I went from working on a TV show in Australia called Neighbours, which Probably Rob's the only person at the table that was Woo. ever heard of that. Thanks, Rob. Um, Thanks, Rob. <laughs> big in Australia and big in the UK. Um, but, but uh, you know, th there's 30-something, you know, around 30 cast members. You all, no one has trailers. Um, no one has a chair on set with your name on it. There's no omelette chef. You're just in one, like, you have one green room. God, the conditions are <laughs> yeah. 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 How do they? How do they expect you to work? And, so I, I like that's what I thought a set set was like to be in one room with thirty of your castmates and like you know if someone wanted a cup of tea like you'd I'd be make I always made the tea for everyone that was like my thing I did and, um, and then I got on set in America and I was I mean first just flabbergasted by the production value and how much bigger and more money mm. there, there was um, but then everyone's like so your trailers or your rooms over here and I was like on my own. Like, <laughs> everyone was separated and I hated that. I would like knock on people's doors and be like, do you want to hang out? It's really weird to be sitting like in this mm -hmm. room on my own now. And, and I felt like there, yeah, it was just, it, it was just so bizarre to me that, that the actors were kind of kept separate. It was just odd, but, but I did really appreciate it's, it's sometimes it is wonderful to have more more money for a project. I mean, the things you can do, the more hours, like we used to shoot an episode a day and then suddenly we had like a whole month to shoot an episode and I was like, I get how many takes to do this? This is incredible. So, um, yeah, I guess I was, yeah, it was just very different. Mm. How you, you also came from outside and started working yeah. in the industry. Um, it's just the the people. Like I think uh, in, in France, where I started out, um, you know, you're max fifty people. Um, same thing. You don't necessarily have a trailer, or it's like one room for everybody. Um, but the quality of the work, I think, is the same. Like I think um, the luxury is time. I think um, you know we have here. I feel like I have more time to do stuff. All right, I'm curious, the life of actors has been changed recently in the past five years with the rise of social media and kind of the microscope people are under. Do you think that social media has made your lives better or worse? You quit Twitter, so yeah, you, why worse. did you quit Twitter? It, well, I had very little impulse control and I <laughs> couldn't stop myself from saying something to somebody and then that just, you're just adding oxygen to a fire and then right. you, and all of a sudden you've got a conflagration and all of a sudden something that doesn't exist in the real world at all mm. is something that you're thinking about and something that like takes broadband in your brain of something you could so easily be focused on something else so much more productive. And it's something that if you just put your phone down, it goes away and it's gone. It's not right. real, it's not anything concrete. And it just was a waste of time. And it's a toxic environment. No one goes on the internet to say anything nice. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it just not, it's not the done thing. So I thought- But some people with a measure of celebrity feel that they can use that platform to advocate for things they care about or to do good. And people do sure. it successfully. You don't, you don't agree with that? Maybe I just couldn't do it successfully. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was just really bad at it. I don't know. How about you, Brian? What do you think about that? Well, I certainly have gotten into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have now is a whole new technological uh, advancement of, of tools. It's just like anything else. It, it, you should be able to learn how to use the tool and not allow it to use you. Mm. And I think that's what you're talking about. Mm. Being able to show restraint and, and circumspect as far as when you need and want to use this and how to use it. But it's like having a, a 
nice piece of cake in front of you mm -hmm. if you're trying to diet. You don't want to bring it into the house. Mm -mm. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, the impulsivity uh, factor is, is too, it's very tempting, um, but it's also permanent. It's mm -hmm. like getting a tattoo each time, you know. Um, so you gotta be careful. Do you feel an obligation to speak up on certain issues and use your platform? I don't feel an obligation, I feel a desire. I don't mm -hmm. want to be a person with no, no opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially now with all the things that are going on in our country, um, both you know, politically and socially in our industry and, and others. It's a very trying, challenging time. Mm -hmm. But I, I am an optimist and I do believe that sometimes even a society has to go through a breakdown in order to have a breakthrough. And that's what we're going through. We're breaking down now in, in many social circle, circles. And I see the silver lining that, that there is hope out there. The way we treat other people and, and lack of respect now is, is keen on, on our consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that's good. And to talk about it is, is really good. And hopefully, not only things improve in our industry, but in, in every other sector. Hmm. What is your take on people who feel that they don't want to speak up on certain issues, like particularly the, the recent harassment stories that have been out? Yeah, I mean, it's it, on one hand, you have a great opportunity, but on the other hand, you have a great responsibility to handle it appropriately mm -hmm. and bring something positive out of the horrible situation. Mm -hmm. I think coming forward is a... Extreme, far more complicated than anyone can imagine unless they're in that position. So I, I, I would bear no judgment on anyone who didn't want to come forward with their story. I, I would hope that anyone who did knows that they can and be supported 100%. Yes. And I have to say, I have never spoken to so many actresses that I've never met than I have in the last couple of months. Things like that, and there's such a sense of community, which is really wonderful, and it's sad that that had to come out of a horrible situation, but there is a support network there and, and ready, and everyone wants to make themselves mm -hmm. readily available to support anyone who wants to come forward. Do you think there will be real change that's lasting? You can't say I hope so, because everybody says I hope so. Yes, I think so too. Well, I, I think every industry needs to change. I mean, it's not just the film industry. The big revelation for me right now is human resource departments have not been protecting the workers, they've been protecting companies. Mm -hmm. And that has to change, first and foremost. But I think a lot of people are, you know, using their power to make sure change happens. So I hope so, mm -hmm. but I know so. Okay, yeah. do you know so? I don't know so, but I, I, I feel like we're seeing the change as it's happening. All mm -hmm. these men are gone, and um, I'm actually uh, amazed how many companies have really said and, and separate ties with those men immediately. They'll mm -hmm. get just a slap on the back and they come mm -hmm. back. So actually, that's, you know, it's happening. Do you find that there's a different atmosphere on sets in the past couple months? For those of you that are working I've only just stopped shooting a couple weeks ago, and mm -hmm. it felt like set life to me. It, it wasn't different in the sense that the male actors were scared to talk to any female actors right. or anything like that. No. <laughs> but yeah, it is a weird industry. We don't have an HR department. There's a lot of gray area in our, yeah. in our job and, and a lot of very intimate situations that you need to make yourself vulnerable to. And it changes job by job. Some jobs yeah. are done in six weeks, you know, mm -hmm. like, or, or some jobs go for six months and it is an issue you need to solve at the time. There are just so many variables and it changes so constantly. It, mm -hmm. It's difficult to find structure in that sort of environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think agencies and managers need to look at that. Maybe they play the role of the HR mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's been some culpability in the agencies. Go, but don't go alone. They're already mm -hmm. telling them there might something you know, that they need to be aware of. And hopefully that's, that's ended. That no one should be put in a position of, uh, you know, being oppressed or feeling in danger of any kind. Right. Just mutual respect. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that we have seen a turning yeah. point. And I agree with Octavia. I don't think it's exclusive to the entertainment business. I think this is in academia, it's in business, it's in politics. It gets more attention in our business right. because mm -hmm. of the people involved. Right. But I don't think it's exclusive to mm. us. No, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, let's talk about your film for a moment. It's a revenge film. Where did you draw upon to play that character? 
You know what? I didn't go into it looking at it like a, as a revenge film, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, to me, this is a movie about grief and a woman's journey of how to find a way to keep going or not keep going, you know? I prepped this movie for about six months and I sat in a lot of self-help groups of victims of not just terrorism attacks, but um, brutal murder. And for sure, one of the things that is very remarkable about all of them is that they have a lot of rage because someone was taken from them without them being able to do anything about it, you know. And if given the opportunity, I think a lot of those people would rather go and kill the person that killed their son or killed their husband or whatever. <laughs> I think the, the strength of this film and the fade is not that it's, okay, this is what should be done, this is what you should do. This is this woman's journey, and that was her only way to finish that story, you know. So I looked at it from a very emotional point of view. From, from She goes through all the stages of grief. Rage, um, emptiness, anger, um, hope, you know, the possibilities of a new life, a new child. And then that is not possible. Interesting. Uh, a question for the group. A lot of people ask, you know, if you could have a dinner party, who would you invite? I'm curious, if you could sit down and interview and really talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one for an hour, who would it be? That's a good question. Barack Obama, mm. for me. What would you ask? Why did you go, Barack Obama? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would ask him, I mean, there are things that he has seen and been a part of, and, and now he's seen where our country is, and I would just, actually, I would like to talk to Barack and Joe Biden um, and just gain some perspective from people who've been in the job and uh, perhaps say, what can we as citizens do when the country is so separated and polarizing? So I guess I would talk to both of them. Hmm. How are you? Don't look at me, I don't know. Uh, you said that's interesting. <laughs> I know, it's such a question. I don't have an answer yet though. Let me think about it. I bet Brian does. Uh, well, I've already sat and chatted with Barack. Oh, well, do tell. Sorry, sorry, it's a nasty habit. Um, that was that was uh, 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 that was my that was my joy. I mean, that was what I I did it. Mm -hmm. See, I was able to sit down with him in the Oval Office for an hour and a half. And uh, just I'm really jealous. Just the two of you. Yeah. Just the two of you. It, it was there was a there was a referee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there was a moderator from the New York Times. Hmm. Oh, it was the three of us. For, uh, wow. And, yeah. and th so this was published. It was. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And and um, there were times when I forgot who I was talking to, in in as much as the president of the United States, and he was just a guy. He's a little younger than me but he has daughters, as I do. He is a, a dad, he was very uh, athletic, and uh, there were a lot of things that we had in common. Didn't have a father growing up, neither did I. And so there were a lot of things that we were relating to. And, and then all of a sudden I'm going, <clears throat> <laughs> I'm in the Oval Office, I'm the President. And, uh, but Did he, you steal anything? He, yes. <laughs> His soul. Uh, you know, and, and, but he has such a, an ability to, to dispel this, this sense of you coming in and feeling intimidated. He just calms you down and you're two guys and Hey, you want to take your jacket off? Yeah, can I? You know, I took my yeah. jacket off, rolled up the sleeves, and there we were, two guys chatting. Mm. It was really, a, really a, an eye-opening experience, and um, one I will always remember. Well, thank you, Brian. <laughs> so, yeah. We'll talk. I'll tell you all I want to tell about it. I want to hear everything. Do you have one? Uh, I mean, it's kind of like an actor and everything, but I would love to sit down with Stanley Kubrick. He, mm. he passed away before I got a chance to ever meet or work with him, and I think that that would be... 
it would be, you know, my moment of just being like, this is really happening. Uh, be very quiet, though. Yeah. Wouldn't it? yeah. <laughs> By the way, now. Yeah. Oh, now. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's interesting. Uh, Brian, when you were a kid, what did you get in trouble for? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Uh, I, I was a typical kid. I got into a lot of trouble. Um, I, my dad left the family when I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, and my mom took it very hard. So she kind of escaped through self-medication, and my dad was gone, which left a huge cavity for me to go get in trouble. And I did, I, I did all kinds of things because I didn't have parental guidance. And, you know, it was, I was trying to find my way through. And in fact, um, I was, my family named me Sneaky Pete because I was really sneaky. And later on, years later, I developed a television series based right. <laughs> called Sneaky Pete. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and using some of those same kind of troublemaking things. When I was in high school, I had two uh, ID cards. One was Brian Cranston and one was Bill Davis. <laughs> or Bill Johnson, actually. Bill Johnson would be the one that I would whip out whenever I got into trouble. <laughs> it's like Bill Johnson got into a lot of trouble. Oh. <laughs> and back then, there were things called truant officers. I don't know if you guys experienced that back, back then. I'm old. Um, <laughs> but there were truant officers who would, who would basically do a little kind of an arrest if you're skipping school, if you're at the mall. if you're there, They were all over the place. And Bill Johnson got in trouble so often, oh, wow. he got sent to the, in fact, he got to the point where the truant officer started knowing my name. Bill, again, <laughs> you know, we're gonna have to call your parents. And I go, oh, you're gonna call George and Dottie <laughs> yeah. Johnson, <laughs> mm, maybe. How about you, Rob? What I get into trouble yeah. for? Um, lying, lots of lying, yeah. lots of stealing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love lying. Okay. Well, you are an actor now, so. Yeah. It's weird. That's one of the only detriments of becoming, getting any kind of fame or anything, because you can't really lie anymore. Right. Because everyone finds everything out, and it's awful. Yeah. And I, remember the, I remember when I used to audition for things, and I, one of the main things I used to do is people would always question your American accent ability. And so I realized, oh, well, if I just go in and say I'm American and make up a whole other character to play the character, um, then they would no longer question it. And then no one questioned your accent afterwards. But then uh, after the first Twilight came out, I would still say, like, oh, I'm from Denver or whatever. Right. Like, and they'd be like, what uh, is he talking not. about? <laughs> Why are you pretending to be someone else? Like, like, um, yeah, it was a harsh, harsh lesson to learn. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. You grew up outside the country. Yeah, I'm, I moved around a lot. I moved probably on average every year to mm -hmm. a new place or a new home. So uh, it was just general mischief, you know, like kid shit. You know, you just, you, 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 you start playing with fire. You light a few things on fire by accident. You, you, know, <laughs> you, you see like, you see like power tools. And all of a sudden I, I got in trouble when I was like four or five for drilling a bunch of holes in, in a car. Cause I found a power tool and I was like, this is awesome. I, mean, I can just and about 10 holes in. I was like, uh -oh. oh, this is really bad. I can't really wipe this off. Uh, you know, it was just, you know, mischief, you know? You have a lot of energy. You a power tool at five? I, well, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. No I know, parental you, guidance. Parental yeah. guidance. Yeah. <laughs> you get, you, you just, you have a lot of energy and you don't have a direction to focus it on and it can eat you alive. And right? I love how he said, we, I lit things on fire by accident. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that might go part and parcel with the lying thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It was definitely not an accident. In these jobs, you, you get to meet odd and interesting people, and Barack Obama excluded. Who is the most interesting person that you've met? Did I read, you met Charles Manson? I did. Did you? Ooh. Tell us that story. His place where he was hanging out with his hippie crowd was uh, called the Spawn Ranch, which rented horses, go horseback riding. My cousin and I would go every once in a while, and the last time we went, I was... 10, I think, unless she was 11. And we were renting horses from the old guy. And some guy comes running into the office going, Charlie's on the hill, Charlie's on the hill. And then we, it startled us so much. He goes, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And we look out the window and there's about eight to 10 guys, men and women, jumping on their horses, gathering them together and galloping down the trail. 
Wow! About 20 minutes later, we see that trail of horses coming back. Now, the width of this trail was, was less than this table. So you're passing by very close to each other. And there were a bunch of horses, and then there was a guy in the middle sitting on a horse, but he wasn't holding his reins. The person in front was holding his reins. And the, this guy was short, black hair down to here, dark black eyes and a beard, and he was just moving to the undulation of the horse. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. It's like this, you know. And, we, and we're coming by and passing by, and we're like staring at him all the way and not saying a word, and they pass. And my cousin turns around, she was in front, she goes, that must be Charlie. <laughs> well, we didn't think anything of it. We didn't even tell it. So uh, this was before the murders? It was about a, a year before the murders. Okay. Wow. And then uh, the murders happen, they capture him, and I had forgotten all about that incident until here's the face of the guy we just arrested. Right. And I just about spit out whatever I had in my mouth. That's the guy. I immediately went back. <gasps> oh, my mm. cousin called me. And, oh, 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 Right. It was crazy. Yikes. Yeah. Wow. Right. Other than murderers, any uh, <laughs> oh God, most interesting you... person you've met? God, I wish I had someone that jumped out. Uh, yeah, try to beat that one. Yeah. 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 He was pretty interesting. Why did you meet the yo-yo champion? Oh. We were shooting Lone Ranger, and it was one of those things where they just had a massive budget, and uh, <laughs> Tom Wilkinson had to do a thing where he pulls out a pocket watch and flips it around, and it comes and lands and opens on his hand. And it was like a cool little trick. So they're like, let's bring in the yo-yo world champion. <laughs> wow. And, and he was like, that's not a yo-yo. They go, yeah, but can you help him do it? And he goes, yeah, you pull it out of your pocket and you do that. And Tom goes, oh, like this, click. And he's like, yeah, just like that. And then he was with us for the rest of the movie. <laughs> Great gig. Yeah. Great gig. So you're talking about your yo-yo tricks. So he's like, here, walk the dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is going to sound crazy, but I'm like total serial killer nerd. And John Douglas, I read his book Mind Hunter, mm -hmm. and like 15 years ago, I got bumped up to first class and the flight attendant said his first and last name, like, what do you, would you like chicken or fish? And I'm like, oh my God, I love you. <laughs> and I talked him all the way from Los Angeles to Atlanta, but it, he was kind. And, Did he think and, you were a serial killer? By <laughs> <then>? <laughs> oh no, he, he was actually impressed that I like could talk to him about that type of, it's kind of crazy. So uh, this year I decided to make my motorcycle license in deep Georgia. So that was a um, culture shock, to say the very least. I'd never turn on a motorcycle. It was me and 20 Harley Davidson guys. It was pretty awesome. Like there was barbecuing in the parking lot on my, I, I, I just, I, it, not that they were crazy, but I was completely fascinated. I had never met anyone like this. And they thought I was nuts, really, is what they thought. They were like, what is this girl? They were like, you gonna drop the bike? You gonna drop the bike? And I kind of did, but they like picked me up. They, I, it was like awesome. I'm like still into, touch with them. So All watch right. out if you ever see me on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come close. I was recently doing a film and the director asked if everyone in the crew could write down the craziest thing that's happened to them in their lives. And then it was released on the last day, everyone handed out and you had to pick whose story matched up with who. So you didn't put your name on it, you just wrote no, the crazy story. No, you just wrote the thing and then everyone had to guess who it was. It just reminded me that like fascinating people are Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. The things like someone had been engaged to the princess of Zanzibar, someone else had been in a plane crash where only 10 people survived and they were one of them. Like people had the wow. craziest Ooh. things and, and it just reminds you, there, there are fascinating stories everywhere. Everyone has a story. Everyone what was your story? I once found a, uh, and no one guessed that this was me, I found a human foot on the beach in Nicaragua once. <laughs> okay. Wow. And on that note, oh, wow. <laughs> I want to thank our guests. Just I want to change the most interesting person. I know, I know. I want to go back. Uh, uh. She right, uses it as a doorstop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A little souvenir. It's in her purse currently. Yeah, no. uh, on that note, I want to thank our guests for this episode of Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Thank you. Ready? Okay, quiet on set. And I look down the lens. Yeah. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Margot Robbie. Brian Cranston. Robert Pattinson. John Boyega. I'm Sam Rockwell. Willem Dafoe. Emma Stone. Allison Janney. Guillermo del Toro. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter. On YouTube. On YouTube.